Hello, I'm Shane Stevenson, and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, the Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park, its past, present, and future. All right, I'm Shane Stevenson. Uh, I'm the museum director uh, here at the Buffalo Naval Park, and I've given these University Express talks in the past, uh, but never in this way. So I hope this is a, uh, you'll, you'll learn something from uh, our discussion uh, while taking on this unique format. So our vision statement at the Buffalo Naval Park, what is it? Uh, we want to be a premier destination in honoring all veterans and their families uh, to celebrate our freedoms. Right? We do that through a variety of different ways, through our artifacts, uh, through our vessels, of course. All right, so our mission statement is why we exist. All right, so it's to provide engaging and inspiring educational visitor experiences that preserve and honor the contributions of all veterans. All right, our mission statement can also be boiled down into four words. Honor, educate, inspire, and preserve. We want to honor so one of the veterans we like to honor is uh, Eugenia King. All right, so here she is here. She was a nurse during the Vietnam War. All right, so there she is in her uh, formal portrait and a nice picture of her. She worked on the hospital ship USS Tranquility. And uh, there she is during the Vietnam War. We also like to honor those Rosie the Riveters or Wendy the Welders, All right? So this is a woman named Mitzi Ziegler who worked at the Curtis Wright uh, plant, All right? And she was a nose cone inspector during World War II. So typically during World War II, women were only allowed to serve in administrative or medical fields in the military. Right, so a lot of the women, when the men went off to uh, to enlist uh, or to go to war, uh, many women filled in. In the we also like to honor individuals like Glenn Gray. Right, so here he is. Uh, when I met with him, he had some pictures. He served aboard the USS Little Rock in the 1960s, and he always told me. When I met with him, he had the best job, all right, as he was the driver for the Admiral, all right? So the little, USS Little Rock was a flagship, which meant that when an Admiral in the Navy would visit the fleet, he would stay aboard the flagship. And so Glenn Gray was able to jaunt around Italy, all right, go to Rome and Naples and other parts of Italy as the... Admiral's driver. All right, so there's the car that he drove, which was stowed on board. And there he is with, and this gentleman is Admiral Martin and with Admiral Martin's wife. Naturally, we want to honor uh, Western New Yorkers that paid the ultimate sacrifice. And Jerry Riley is there on the top, and Edmund Mazgawa is there on the bottom. And they both served aboard. Uh, the short and infamous uh, service of the USS Juno, which is also known as the ship that housed the five Sullivan brothers and two of the four Rogers brothers. All right, so these boys from Buffalo may have known the Sullivan brothers and little did they know and they would be proud to know that a ship named after the five brothers is sitting in the Buffalo Harbor right now. Naturally, we also honor the five Sullivan brothers, All right? Looking from left to right, we've got Joseph and Francis and Albert and Madison and George. Albert in the middle was the youngest at about 20 and George was the oldest. He's the one on the far right at about 26 years of age. All right, so all five boys, boys perished and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt decided to name a ship after them. And that's the one we have in our harbor. 
Naturally, I'll talk about our ships here, USS Little Rock, USS The Sullivans, USS Croker, and a little about the USS PTF-17. You'll see those designations. Uh, CL means cruiser light or light cruiser. CLG for Little Rock also means cruiser light guided. And CG4, CG stands for cruiser guided, meaning guided missiles. DD stands for destroyer and SS stands for submarine. And SSK stands for submarine killer. So USS Little Rock here, you'll see this is the way she looked and the current way she looks while she's firing off one of her Talos missiles, uh, of which we have two on the launcher on the fantail of, this, of the USS Little Rock. So that's a nice little action shot as the Talos missile is being fired. Here you'll see a, a, a picture that shows her original configuration as a cruiser light uh, CL-92. So she was the 92nd cruiser uh, constructed. You'll see some dates there. The keel was laid in 43. She was launched in 44, commissioned in 45. All right, decommissioned in 49. Converted for those three years from 57 to 60 and served from 1960 to 1976. And she was brought to Buffalo in 77 and opened in 1979 to the public. It was constructed by the Cramp Shipbuilding Company in Philly, in Philadelphia. It was sponsored by the wife of uh, Little Rock, Arkansas Councilman. And she was one of 27 Cleveland-class cruisers constructed, of which the USS Little Rock is the only ship remaining in her class. And even when she was converted to a CLG like she is today, there were five others constructed. They have also been scrapped as well. So she is the only remaining from their Cleveland class and also from the CLG class of cruisers. So as maybe you saw from the dates, the by the time she was seaworthy and put out to sea, uh, World War II was coming to a close. And so she went right down to South America and toured uh, the ports of South America and into early 46. Uh, through the rest of the season, through the rest of the year in '46, she served and toured various European ports. From '47 to '49, she was on the Atlantic coast of America. In '49 to '57, she was decommissioned and taken out of service, and then reconfigured from '57 to '60, from CL92 to CLG4. Okay, so you see the conversion there, how much it cost, what equipment was used, the armament. So by the time she was brought back into service in 1960, those gun turrets that you'd know from World War II wouldn't have stopped anything. All right, so they were still good at stationary targets. They put their main thrust into the Talos missile system, which she would carry about 46 to 48 on board and they actually were nuclear capable, so they did carry nuclear warheads as well after 1960. Now these Talos missiles were for surface to air, so they were designed to take down MiG jets from the Russians. Right, and they can travel about 65 miles at many thousands of miles per hour, 3,000 miles per hour. All right, so that was the main weapon but she never fired a weapon in anger during all of her service. Here's a lovely broadside shot of her, uh, kind of an outboard profile that you'd call it, of her original configuration. You see her two stacks in the middle there. You see the bridge, you see the aft bridge. And if you take a look right on the stern, what we'd call the fantail, uh, you can see there are two Kingfisher planes, although the picture only shows one, and those were recon planes. 
So they could be launched off a catapult, and there are two of them. There are catapult tracks. They would launch, do a recon, and then they would land back in the water, either on the starboard or port side. And if you notice the crane on the very end there of the fantail, that would reach over the side of the ship, whether on port or starboard, and lift the plane back onto the catapult and get her ready for her next service. All right, so so it's she was a very pretty ship, and as they all were at the Cleveland class. All right, here's the second commissioning or the recommissioning of the USS Little Rock in 1960, and some of her crew. Uh, back in her original configuration, she could hold about 700 uh, 700 sailors. After her conversion, she was able to accommodate up to about uh, 1,300 uh, sailors, marines, and crew. So while they didn't change the outside shape, there was a lot that changed on the inside, which allowed her to hold more crew during a cruise. All right, this is a fabulous picture from Glenn Gray, uh, the gentleman that I showed earlier who is the driver for the Admiral. Now, she was a flagship, which is why the Admiral would stay on board uh, when visiting the fleet. But with the USS Little Rock, they found that she was quite top-heavy. And while we don't have seriously rolling seas here, you could see that list is, my word, that might be a 20-degree list, 15-degree list. Um, so that's a pretty serious list. Uh, for waters that are relatively calm. All right, here's the USS The Sullivans. All right, this is a nice uh, top-down view, which will give you a nice look at her configuration during World War II. Now, here's some of her dates here, laid down in 1942, 10th of October. You can see the name change there, all right? So originally she was going to be called the USS Putnam, but again, when the five brothers uh, perished together, they Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, we need to name a destroyer after them. And she's the only ship in the whole history of the Navy that's named after more than one person. She was launched in 43, commissioned in 43, all right, recommissioned again in 51, decommissioned in 65. She was in Mothball for about 12 years and then uh, came here in 77, and we opened her to the public in 79. All right, I'll try to be brief here, but that's a very important photograph in the history of the Sullivans. It's uh, the Sullivans going to the rescue of the burning aircraft carrier, the USS Bunker Hill. Right, that's 1944. Uh, there was an individual named George Mendonza, all right, who was at the helm of the USS Sullivans. And so he's steering the boat or the ship, and they pull alongside to rescue some of the crew, and there's burning, dead bodies, people just jumping off the flight deck into the water and dying and drowning. So there's a lot of, obviously, there's a lot of uh, death and destruction going on on board the USS Bunker Hill. Well, they rescued about 166 sailors off of the Bunker Hill. They pull away, and there's a hospital ship. Now, on the hospital ship, uh, as he's steering uh, to go alongside, he sees all the nurses, right, that are, you know, on the decks waiting to save these sailors' lives. And he's very emotionally affected by that. He looks to his left, there's fire, death, destruction. He looks to these to his right and he sees what he considered angels. All right, so now you flash forward, flash flash forward a little bit, and now it's VJ Day, Victory Over Japan, 1945, and he's in New York City with his girlfriend, right, and they're at a picture show, 
Word comes over the loudspeaker, the pitcher, the film stops. Everyone rushes out, and he sees a nurse, and he says it takes him back to this moment that this photograph is taken from. And he grabs the nurse, and he kisses her. Right? So George Mendonza is otherwise known as the Kissing Sailor, probably the most famous photograph from World War II. And we're very proud, doubly proud, of the ship, but that he was the helmsman aboard USS the Sullivan. All right, well, that's a fabulous story. A little of her service in 1944, she screened airstrikes on the island of Truk, screened airstrikes on Saipan, bombarded Iwo Jima, rescued 118 men from the USS Houston, which was torpedoed. In 45, you see anti-kamikaze picket duty off Okinawa. It was very famous for, it's kind of when kamikazes were used on en masse for the first time. And as I already talked about, rescued 166 men from the USS Bunker Hill. She also participated in the Korean War and was tasked with bombarding railroads, bridges, rolling stock, tunnels. Right? Uh, and from 54 to 60, she was in East Coast and Mediterranean deployments. She participated in the retrieval of Alan Shepard for the Mercury Project astronaut and engaged in the Cuban Missile Crisis in the blockade of Cuba. And there's part of her uh, decommissioning crew in October of 1945, after the war. So as I mentioned, destroyers were kind of like the workhorses. All right, and so these are some of the duties. They supported the fleet against surface submarine and air attacks, provide shore bombardment, act as a radar picket to provide early attack warnings, defended against kamikazes, rescued downed pilots, and rescued sailors aboard crippled ships. All right, as with all three of our major vessels that we preserve, um, she did go through two conversions in 1945 and in 1959 to upgrade her radar and new technologies. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about uh, the Croker, USS Croker. There's a nice picture on her launching day in December of 1943. All right, so you'll see her keel was laid for uh, in 1943, commissioned in 44, served for the rest of the war that year and a half, decommissioned in 46, recommissioned and converted into in 1953, and was in service from 53 to 71, arrived in Buffalo in 1988, and opened to the public in 1989. So last year was our 30th anniversary of having her open to the public. All right, constructed as many boats were by the Electric Boat Company in Groton. She was a Gato class submarine, and there were 77 of them. All right, and they're all named after fish. All right, when I give this presentation or people come aboard uh, and they're from Minnesota or Michigan, they're very familiar with croakers, <clears throat> but I don't believe they're native to the, the Western New York area. And six are remaining as museum ships out of the 77 currently. So when we talk about, when you talk about a ship, a surface ship, they are cruises, all right? When she goes out, leaves port, does a mission, comes back to port, that's a cruise. For submarines, they're called war patrols. All right, so you see that the Croker in that year and a half she was in service in World War II conducted six war patrols, and you'll see the mileage, the number of days, and very interestingly, the number of days submerged. All right, if we think of a submarine today, they can remain underwater for almost forever. 
right? They only have to surface to change crew and to bring more food on board. Other than that, they can remain underwater forever. Submarines back in World War II were not like that, right? They could only submerge for a few hours at a time. So you'll see the number of total days of a, of a war patrol, and then actually the number of days that she was submerged. All right, so it was almost just half that time for most of the war patrols, about 50% of her time she was underwater. All right, USS Croker had a very successful war patrols, and as you'll see, these were her sinkings. The mother load was the first one, so she came out of the gate really strong, and that was the cruiser Nagara. All right, the cruiser Nagara was the lead ship of her class. All right, so she had other ships called the Nagara class cruisers. All right, she had participated in other battles, and there is some belief that she actually helped uh, sink the USS Juno. All right, so other than that, you'll see that most of the sinkings were for material, what we'd call auxiliary ships. The goal of the American submarine force was to sink material that the Japanese needed to carry on the battle, right? So if you're sinking oil, you know, you're sinking oilers, you're sinking oil, you're sinking freighters of troops, you're sinking freighters of food, bedding supplies, machinery parts, you are taking away the enemy's ability to conduct war. Unlike the Japanese, which they had to actually attacked capital ships, they attacked our actual military vessels. Right, that was their primary target. But for the Americans, the primary target was the material to keep the Japanese forces going. You sink enough of those, they have they don't have the ability to fight anymore. All right, it's also believed that the Croker sank two other vessels. But to actually put them on your scoreboard, or otherwise known as your kill board, which is like the flag, the battle flag, right, you actually had to get a picture or a film of the ship actually sinking. All right, so this is the Nagara. The shot was uh, from the stern, the aft torpedo room. She shot a spread of four torpedoes, one hit, right in the right spot, and here she is sinking down by her stern. But you had to get that picture right, to prove that you sank that. So also what happened was for the other two vessels, for whatever reason, they fired the torpedoes, had the countdown with the stopwatch, you know, for timing, heard the explosions, heard the ship sinking, but they had to sink quickly. They also had to submerge quickly uh, and were not able to get a periscope shot. So they heard the explosions, they heard the ships cracking up and being destroyed, but they could not get this photograph, and so they couldn't claim it as a full kill. All right, so you'll see that um, she won three battle stars for her 11 sinkings, uh, and then she went back into service and was mostly protecting the coasts from the Soviet fleet in the 50s and 60s and into 1971. All right, so I hope you enjoyed a little about that history of our three vessels. All right, a little bit about our park itself. We opened on the 4th of July 1979, mostly as a naval park, but now we serve all the branches of service. Here's a picture of our original site. If you went to go visit us at some point up until about 2003, this is what you'd probably look at. <laughs> we also have a museum on the second floor, uh, but it doesn't look like this anymore. Okay, we are 2020 and 2021. We are honoring the 75th anniversary of the ending of World War II. So the, this floor has been converted all to World War II uh, artifacts and Western New York stories. So I hope when we're open again, you can come down and visit us. We certainly have a yard. 
All right, so this is the yard, and if you take a quick look, you'll see all those big, vicious teeth. All right, that is our PTF-17, which is our fast patrol boat, which served in the Vietnam War for four years from 68 to 72, and then she came back to the Great Lakes and served as a patrol boat on the Great Lakes, mostly in Chicago uh, and Lake Michigan. All right, we also have a very nice and large memorial garden, right, with 14 monuments on them. So here's our Pearl Harbor Memorial. All right, this is our Purple Heart Memorial. All right, so that's the one medal that no one really wants to get, All right? But we do honor uh, those individuals that received Purple Hearts and lived to, and lived or they receive them posthumously. Or we do obviously honor uh, our veterans who fought in the Korean Memorial, or the Korean War, with a memorial here. We also have our Vietnam Memorial, which was the first um, memorial constructed down at the uh, Buffalo and Erie County Naval and Military Park. We also honor, uh, more close in time, we honor uh, veterans who have died during the Iraq and Afghanistan conflict with that memorial. And coming in 2021 is the first ever memorial dedicated to African Americans as a whole uh, and their contribution to all of our conflicts fought since the Revolutionary War. So as I mentioned, this is the first memorial dedicated to all African Americans in the country. So we'll be very proud to have those on our uh, veteran memorial uh, gardens. All right, so here's some of our statistics. We get we see visitors from over 100 countries, and two thirds are from out of town. We get about 52,000 people on board every year. About 300,000 people walk by the park every year, and we get about 5,000 5, people attending our various events throughout the year. We also have a ton of affiliated groups that we work with. You see ship associations, Boys and Girl Scouts, Tin Can Sailors, uh, the Buffalo Bay Submarine Vet Group. We have a large collection of docents who are all veterans that serve and give their time uh, to make your visit uh, more enjoyable. So we're caretakers, right? We honor, educate, inspire, and preserve. All right, so we have thousands of artifacts, whether that be paper or 3D uniforms, and we're the largest inland naval park in the country. All right, and mostly we care for the three, that are three large water born vessels. All right, it's important to note that we don't get really any funding from the federal government. Most people think we get some stuff, some funding from the Navy, but we do not. They require us to do certain things with the ships every year, but they offer no money uh, in return. All right, our updated hangar building is something new a new entrance and visitor center, new exhibits like I mentioned, the World War II exhibit on the second floor uh, for 2020 and 2021. I have created an audio tour that you can listen to as you walk around the ships. All right, there's certainly ways to honor a veteran in your life. We do have the gallery of portraits. We do flag dedications. Uh, we have a wall of honor. So if you have a veteran in your family or if you are a veteran and you'd like to uh, work with us to either get a picture or a flag dedication or your name on our wall of honor, you can please feel free to reach out to us. As mentioned, we don't really get much funding from the federal government at all. <clears throat> 90, about 95% of our funding comes from visitors, from ticket sales, from encampments. 
from gift shop sales, retail sales. All right, so we're always trying to work with new members. All right, there's always something going on at the Naval Park uh, year round. We're going to be offering a speaker series in the wintertime. Uh, you know, so we're really upgrading what we will offer. So we do have memberships. We'd love to have you become a member. We do have one, two, or three year memberships. You'll see for families or for individuals uh, the pricing there. All right, and we'd love to see you down there and supporting us. All right, so this is uh, what our new building uh, will look like, our new entranceway, our new visitor's center. All right, so that's something that we're looking forward to having in 2021. All right, fair winds and following seas to you all. Uh, obviously, the slide is if I was standing in front of you, um, but I'm not. <laughs> so uh, I hope you enjoy. I hope you enjoyed this uh unique perspective of the Buffalo Naval Park. Again, my name is Shane Stevenson, and I'm the director of museum collections, all right, the curator at the uh, Buffalo Naval Park, and maybe we'll see you down sometime. And again, fair winds and following seas to you all.